A few years ago, I had the privilege of going to the Holy Lands uh, on a pilgrimage. It was truly an eye-opening experience. I hope that perhaps we might be able to organize a visit someday in the not too distant future for ourselves. During the trip, I had the opportunity to visit Jerusalem, in particular, the Old City, which is the city as we know it represented in our scripture. As you can imagine, in 21st century, Jerusalem proper is much larger than what the Old City was back then. To walk down the streets that so many have walked for thousands of years, to walk in the steps of Christ carrying the cross, uh, words do not fully capture the experience. We visited the southern point of the old city where modern day excavation has revealed some of what used to make up the city wall. Parts of the area are still being excavated to this day. Here I got to see the steps that went up to the southern entrance to the city, which is currently blocked off. But these steps are famously known for where the Jews, uh, when the Hebrew people, Israelites, when they were making their pilgrimage, they would recite the Psalms of Ascent. The Psalms of Ascent being the 14 Psalms from Psalm 120 to 134, one Psalm uh, recited at each step. Psalm 121 is likely the most familiar. I lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I was also able to visit the remains of the old temple structure, what is more commonly known as the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. It is the support wall for the temple that once stood there. The Romans had brought down the second temple in 70 AD, but this support wall remained and has stood there since the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. It was breathtaking to see buildings from an era that were only stories in my mind, to see it in front of me. Now that was truly a sight to behold. And of course, I was surprised at the size of the structure, an enormous wall with huge rocks huge rocks, and that was only just the base support wall of the temple. I wish I could give you some comparison perhaps with the Egyptian pyramids or the monuments in Peru, but I have never visited and therefore cannot give a point of reference other than the fact that to me, they appeared quite massive. And having seen the structure, I can appreciate the excitement and the awe that the disciples are expressing in today's gospel reading. I imagine what the temple must have meant to the disciples as well as the other Jews at the time. As a Jewish person, the temple was a symbol of their identity. It was both a sign of who they were and also whose they were. They were the chosen people of God, and the temple was proof of God and proof of God's power and might. Even if you were not Jewish, you could still appreciate just the scale. I mean, the organizational effort, the human resources that would have been necessary logistically to have such a building of that magnitude be built on top of a mountain in the Judean desert. That itself is truly astonishing. I'm fully convinced that the temple gave the Jewish people a sense of pride and stability. You might be thinking that, well, the disciples, they must have seen the building dozens of times with the three annual pilgrimage that they would have to make, one for Passover, one for the Festival of Weeks that we call Pentecost, and the Festival of Tents. Why would something so familiar uh, be so astonishing? And yet... We know from seeing the red rocks in Sedona or visiting the Grand Canyon, we don't tire of seeing them because, well, there's simply too many areas that one can truly appreciate. The experience is never fully exhausted. I believe that was what the disciples were experiencing. And yet, this was not what Jesus saw in the building for the future. He tells his disciples that all of this, all of its grandeur, all of its status, it would have to come crumbling down. There are different interpretations that can be 
made upon reading this scene, this story. The first, of course, is the literal crumbling down of the temple. This is how the disciples understood Jesus and why they were concerned about when that would happen. They wanted to know because they probably wanted to avoid being there or um, just it would have been quite a scene. But this was a literal interpretation. Why would something so important for the Jewish people need to be torn down? Uh, Well, perhaps because there's also a spiritual interpretation, one that is pivotal to us as Christians. The temple being the place and the method of which people were to be reconciled to God, to have access to God, would no longer stand because Jesus would stand in that place. Jesus would be the way for us to be reconciled to God, and Jesus would be our way to encounter God. The physical temple would need to crumble, and Christ would need to be raised in its place, because ultimately, Jesus is the rock of our salvation, not the stones that that make up a building. Christians have, in our combined history since 2,000 years ago, raised many other places of worship since. Originally created to help us encounter God and to have access to God's love and mercy through Christ, it's been the long focal point of all of our faith, and yet we know now that something um, has to change. And it's something that many has already known and have questioned. That this building, the way that it stands cannot be the extent that we are a church. I believe the pandemic, hopefully, has opened our eyes to see this. It's not why we, uh, it has, it is why we not only offer this kind of Zoom gathering or uh, YouTube live streams of our in-person gatherings, but why we are intent on continuing to provide digital means of gathering long into the future, even after the pandemic ends. Simply put, There are people who cannot physically be here for various reasons, who without a doubt belong to Christ and belong to the church. The truth is that many of these folks have been with us even before the pandemic, and it's only through the pandemic that we've grown into a common experience where now we can recognize them and the need to serve those who cannot physically be here. Because the church, well, it's not a building. The church is its people. Jesus tells his disciples that the temple, the very structure that grounded them as a people, would need to come down. This was not so much to uproot them or to disorient them for who they were. It was necessary in order to make room for others to join. One of the other perhaps more meaningful experiences I had in the Holy Land was actually resting on a small fishing boat in the Sea of Galilee. The lake was so tranquil, it was hard to imagine that this was the place, the scene, uh, where the disciples were tossed to and fro by waves, thinking that they might drown. Um, It was the stillness of the water uh, brought such a level of peace, and I ended up gazing towards the east, and I saw a mountain range. If you didn't know, the Sea of Galilee sits rather low, even below the sea level, and so there are mountains in just about every direction. My eyes were fixed across the eastern horizon uh, at the uh, edge of the mountain, the range. Beyond the hills, there were desert lands that make up the southern tip of what is now Syria. And beyond that, it goes into Iraq and then Iran. Uh, but continuing east, you would pass Afghanistan, Pakistan, North India, Nepal, China, and you would find yourself in a small peninsula home to the Chosun people, who would later be known as the Koreas. I couldn't help imagine Jesus looking towards the east to that very horizon. And though he never went beyond past even Syria, he had never interacted or seen someone from the far east, I was confident that he thought of us, thought of me, my people. It took nearly 2,000 years for us to receive the gospel on that peninsula. And yet, I believe, I, not because I'm special, but because I represent one of billions of people in that direction, Jesus was thinking about us when he insisted 
that the temple and the structures in Jerusalem would have to come down. For the love of God to be known in our world, a building in a remote desert in the Middle East, no matter how grand and amazing it might be, it would not be sufficient enough to reach all of the people that this uh, that God has created around the world. I share that story with a sense of hope. I know that no one likes to be a part of something that is being torn down. Even when it's for the better, we want to avoid just the simple noise and chaos or even the dust of things collapsing. Certainly no one is thrilled that the ways of uh, that the ways that the church has been meaningful for us when it's or meaningful to our parents or grandparents when they are told to when we're told that they must come down. No one's thrilled about those things or the ways that our gatherings, how it formed us that they would see someday. And yet, yet we are also proof that despite all the changes that have come to us in the church, despite all the changes that have occurred in the life, in the long history of the church, we are still here. I mean, think of when uh, female pastors were first included in leadership and then as uh, preachers and pastors among us. Think of when men and women began to see, be seated together in worship or the kind of music uh, that came. We know the hymns that are sacred to us. They were once tunes from the bar. Uh, music with modern instruments has been at some time considered satanic music. And now it forms so many, so on and so forth. There have been already in our history so much that has come crumbling down only to bear new fruit. To someone faithful in some generation past, our way of church, our way of faithful living must seem to them as nothing but a pile of rubble. And yet... Here we are. We still love God and we still want to share God's love with others. What can be more important than that? I believe that there are at least two and likely a few more major changes that lies ahead of us as Tempe First Church. I believe we will need to make our stance and become a fully inclusive church both in terms of the acceptance of the width and breadth of our sexuality, as well as the width and breadth of our cultural and racial spectrum. These changes may seem like we are taking the very foundations of the church, which, uh, of which the church stands and making it into a pile of rubble. And yet I am convinced that God can take that pile of rubble and make it fertile once more. I mean, I am, you all are, living proof that this happens. This happened in the past. It will happen yet again in the future. The only question is, where will you be? It's quite normal to feel upset or uneasy about this feature. I mean, even the disciples were uneasy, hence why they approached Jesus privately and asked him, when was this going to happen? But the gift we have is that we are able to see into the future of the disciples when they themselves in our story could not. These same disciples who are concerned about this coming future and when the temple would become a pile of rubble, they were the first ones telling others about it. Where was their fear? Where was their concern? What happened to their sense of identity or stability or pride? What happened to all that this temple meant for them? I will tell you, Christ happened. Their identity was in Jesus Christ. And they were Christ followers, Christ disciples. Their stability came in their faith in God and their faith in Christ. Their pride was in Christ who died and rose again. Christ was all that mattered and what they wanted to tell others about. They didn't stay in the temple ruins, grieving its former glory, feeling powerless because they couldn't erect a new one in its place. They were busy following the Holy Spirit, meeting and sharing Christ's love and mercy to everyone they could meet. They couldn't care less what happened to the temple. If upon meeting the challenges of our era, 
we might come to crumble. And again, we will need to. And you begin to recognize the ruins and rubbles of past glory. There is no shame. If this causes you to feel down or perhaps even upset, I don't think you would be alone in that. And still, it may only be because you are still looking at the ruins instead of looking beyond the horizon. There are people who have yet to discover God's love, and you might be the vessel of that love for them. There are people who have yet to discover the creative ways that the Holy Spirit moves and enables us to take on seemingly impossible challenges. And you might be the voice and the inspiration that leads them there. What may seem like ruin will also be and enable a new generation of inclusion. And if we mean to be a people who puts God's love for the world into action, well, I hope to join you in that rubble also. May it be so.